thanks very much uh, to the organizers here for inviting me to the sustainability seminar. I haven't been to one of these before, so uh, you'll have to bear with me if I underreach or overreach in, in the presentation. But um, we have two talks uh, today at noon here. Uh, we'll want, later, you'll hear from Professor Guo. And uh, the organizers have uh, class today's presentations as creative approaches to solar energy. So we're going to progress from the less creative, and I'll cover that, and then you'll hear from <laughs> Professor Guo about the more creative parts. So uh, actually what I'm going to cover is uh, just a few simple points, I think. Uh, solar cells, as we know them now, uh, unfortunately are better producers of heat than electricity. And uh, maybe that's good for the researchers. It means there's a lot of work to be done to improve them. Uh, and that part is not recognized. So that's one of the points I'll, I'll touch on through the talk. Uh, the research that we're doing in my group uh, is trying to address what I'll call cooler ways of making electricity uh, from solar power. Uh, what I mean by that is ways that avoid heat generation um, and make better use uh, of the energy that's available. And behind all of it is a more general theme that uh, we really need more science, especially at this time when we've got uh, a crisis in uh, energy and ever-increasing needs, it seems, uh, in order to achieve real sustainability, not uh, sustainability in one part of the technology and unsustainability in another portion of it. So here's the problem. Um, We've got a nice bright sun out there. It powers nature on, on Earth. And uh, its light is uh, basically white to the eye, and, but it has a spectrum. It has lots of components of different colors. Um, my slide isn't uh, representative of that. Actually, I've got one spectrum here that's all yellow. But you've all seen light uh, that's scattered through a chandelier, for example, and, and breaks up into its various colors. Each of those colors has... Um, um, it is basically corresponds to different amounts of energy available from the units that compose the light. And I'm going to show you that it's very difficult technologically to deal with the whole spectrum. And that's a major part of the, the problem. A lot of the spectrum that isn't handled correctly uh, electrically uh, gives rise to heat generation. So I take that spectrum here and now I'm going to uh, turn it on its head in a diagram that includes some shaded bands here, which are the energies that a semiconductor knows it uh, can place its various charges in. Uh, usually the charges are in the lower gray region here. They're at a low energy. And it takes something like a certain color of light to promote charges to the upper band. And as you can see, um, the spectrum spans more than the allowed gray energy regions. So first of all, in, in the white portion between the upper and lower bands here, that light can't be used at all. Um, it's just going to pass right through the material. It's basically transparent. There aren't any allowed energy levels. That you can't have any absorption in that region. So it's only above that region that the light becomes useful to begin with. Uh, let's send in light of a certain color here. We'll try some green in the major part of the spectrum. What happens is that some of the charges that are in what's called the valence band down below are promoted to the upper band called the conduction band where they can then be separated and give rise to currents and voltages that uh, is uh, the manner in which solar cells actually work. Well, uh, that works pretty well for the one color that I've picked out there, the green color band, uh, because it has just enough energy to cross this forbidden white region and uh, generate some liberated carriers. But uh, as you can see, there's a big area above that. Uh, let's send in some, some bluer light now, a shorter wavelength, higher energy type of light. And you'll see that the same thing happens basically. Uh, charge is promoted to that upper band, but now it's got too much energy to just cross that band. It, we've done more than just generate charges. We've generated heat because all that excess energy uh, turns into heat as the electron rattles down to the bottom of that band. There's no way to extract that extra energy directly in the current. So it's wasted. Now, when this happens uh, in outer space, as, as it does these days, we've got all sorts of 
uh, amazing arrays, powering satellites and, and the like, and, and uh, missions to Mars and so on. <coughs> uh, it turns out that if you talk to people in the companies uh, who are involved with space technology, the heat that's generated in conventional solar cells is enormously problematic. Uh, right down to the mechanical level, it causes changes and flexing in the structures that affect their uh, operation, their efficiency. And uh, there's only a certain flux that these things can, can handle in general um, to begin with. So uh, we have to imagine that somehow we place these instruments in a region where just the right amount of light is hitting them. They're not saturated, they're not underperforming, and, and so on. Um, so we, we do know how to make solar cells. So we have a place to start in the upper left here. Uh, we know how to make small solar cell units. We put them together into panels. Those panels can be assembled into arrays as you, you see here. And uh, this technology is well developed. It's advanced and it works. Okay. The only problem with it is that uh, you don't get all that much power unless you cover a large area, so we need to scale it up. And when we go to this level to produce megawatts of electricity, unfortunately, for one megawatt of electricity, you get about two megawatts of heat. And in the desert here, this is a shot from the Mojave Desert, um, you can imagine that that's probably not the place you want more heat. And there is not going to be a lot of water available to solve the cooling problem you just gave yourself. So there are two things wrong with this picture, and it's our job to solve them, or the current generation, as I keep telling my students. So uh, I want to spend a minute just talking about efficiency limits in a, a more general way, and we don't need any uh, mathematics to help us out here, just this diagram. Uh, there are a few points that you can already understand on this diagram from, um, with, with a little coaching. Over on the right-hand side, you see the efficiency versus temperature of the reservoir you're trying to give the heat to goes to zero if you have a system that's at about 5,700, 5,800 degrees Kelvin. The reason for that is that's the temperature of the surface of the sun. If your apparatus was as hot as the sun, it radiates as much energy back to the sun as it received. The efficiency goes to zero. Over on the left, if we pick a more reasonable scenario where the apparatus is at room temperature and the reservoir itself that you're trying to give the heat to is at room temperature, efficiency again goes to zero because there's no temperature differential between the two and you can't transfer the heat anywhere. So in between, there's a, a maximum here uh, where presumably we're going to, to operate. Um, and uh, you can see it's pretty high. It goes to 84%. But the assumption in this curve is that you're dealing with one color, that green band that did exactly what we wanted and nothing more, gave enough energy to the system to liberate the charges for the external current uh, and circuit. But um, as we all know, the sun has more colors in it. And to be efficient overall, we have to deal with the other colors. Every time I create another one of these curves for a new color, I've got to multiply their efficiencies together and 0.84 drops below 50% pretty quickly. And the dollar level goes up. Okay. They become very expensive. And uh, in, in principle, with, with n different devices all designed to handle a certain part of the spectrum, where n goes to infinity, we can do a pretty reasonable job of this. But that's far too expensive. Uh, literally, with three designs for different colors, the cost goes into the millions of dollars for one device. So uh, we need a different solution. Uh, typically, as some of you know, the solar cells operate more um, be because we use them at low temperature, um, down around 20% or so. We can do better if we want to spend more money. But we'd really like to be on this other curve here. There's, uh, mysterious curve, which I'll highlight in blue, uh, which approaches unit efficiency in the upper left of the diagram when things are cool. This could be really cool heat, um, really cool uh, power generation. That curve is called the Landsberg limit. It's a theoretical limit that presumes there's some way we haven't thought of yet in which you could generate um, charges and, and make a solar cell without this heat generation. 
Now it doesn't go to 100% because it turns out there's, uh, it's really details, uh, even when you do liberate charges, you can only use the amount of energy that's above the chemical potential of the medium. So there's, we, we miss a little bit at the top of the curve there, but still it's much closer to what we would like and the heat generation would be far less of a problem. So is it possible to uh, come up with something that really uh, performs this way? Well, to this point, the answer is no. However, that uh, in research is called a challenge. <laughs> and we need a discovery. So uh, we need to follow the example of Professor Rittenberg here, who is sitting late in the physics lab one evening. And behind him is a colleague who is about to burst the balloon with, with the needle. And the, the caption reads that Professor, Professor Rittenberg is about to discover the element of surprise. <laughs> we need to do this with light. So uh, here's the slide you've all been dreading. I am going to show you some <laughs> equations. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are impatient wizards and would prefer to jump to the cartoon on the right, you will have to wait a moment or two. So, if we're going to discover anything new here, we have to do something that people haven't done typically. And uh, we don't have to get fancy. Um, we go to something simple that actually most of you probably are already know. It's uh, Newton's second law of motion. F equals ma, force is mass times acceleration, or I've written it here, acceleration equals force over mass. And we write it down mathematically, but we have to do something new with it if we hope to bring a new principle into the problem. What we're going to do is we're going to add a term which everyone drops uniformly in the community because it's small. It's extremely small. It's down by what we call eight orders of magnitude, a factor of 10 to the eighth, that's 100 million smaller than the first term on the right-hand side of the equation I wrote, which is due to the electric field, the, the forcing effect of the electric component of light. And over on the right, I've, I've shown light coming in from the left. That electric field is the vertical component. And when we get to it, you'll see that the charge, uh, once we liberate it, responds to that field. Um, but that's how conventional solar cells work. That's, that interaction is the basis of how they get started. So we need something different. It's this second term I added back in involving what's called the B field, the magnetic field of the light, which is usually ignored. Um, and it's ignored because you can show in a very general way it's e equal to E over C, where C is the velocity of light. C is an enormous number in the usual units, 10 to the, 10 to the 8th, as I said. So the second term should be small, but we're going to leave it in nevertheless. Uh, when we do, uh, you see that the equation itself is written in terms of x on the left, and then the coordinate z gets mixed in by this term we just added. So I need another equation to follow what happens in the second coordinate now. The model is a little more complicated than the usual one, which would be in terms of one coordinate. Uh, but once I've done that, that's it. Okay? So now you, you all have to bear with me while I turn you into uh, differential equation experts. We need the solution to this equation. Uh, I won't actually uh, ask you how we do that. But uh, there is a simple solution to this, and there you go. So, so things are progressing from bad to worse. And, and what is new here is the following. That normally I would have motion in response to the electric field. Now there's a second coordinate. In the direction of travel of the light, there is motion. And this solution describes that in more detail. Uh, we only need the first part of it and, and remark on a few things. Uh, first of all, it is a new solution in the sense that this motion along the direction of travel of the light, I've written down the displacement is equal to something that depends on both the electric and the magnetic fields. This is very unusual. Um, and the other thing is that in the denominator, <coughs> there's a funny quantity which normally doesn't come into uh, optical theory. It's a rotational frequency. It's a resonant frequency for the curved motion I'm going to show you in a minute. And that is a very small factor compared to the frequency of light. So think of it as something approaching zero in the denominator. You all know division by zero is, it gives you a very big number that even the computers can't handle. 
And uh, those are factors multiplying this uh, sine factor, as I've written here. Uh, it doesn't matter wh what that function even means. It's a constant. It's a constant. It is not frequency dependent. So this whole first term responds to both the electric and the magnetic fields. Uh, it could be big because this factor omega rotation is small. And it's a constant. It's a charge displacement along the direction of travel. So let's have a look at the cartoon. You've been hoping I would play here. We're going to watch the motion of uh, an electron, this red dot, in response, uh, first of all, to the electric field. So it begins moving along the electric field as the light travels to the left. But if we consider now the B field, this causes a little deflection and some curved uh, motion, as shown here. And the only question is, is that motion big or small? Because that's very new. Curved motion, it's like motion around a circle. Some of you may know that currents around a circle give rise to magnetic fields. So uh, this is, you're looking at a motion which generates uh, induced magnetization of things. So in my group, we've had a little fun doing things which uh, you may think sound very creative, uh, making water magnetic and some other materials, benzene and so on. Uh, water may, may give you the idea. Uh, magnetizing water using light uh, would definitely be new. So the question is whether this is a big effect or a small effect. Now, as I said earlier, uh, the magnetic effect should be small because this term we added uh, is, in fact, mathematically very small. But we left it in anyway. And we see an interesting possible solution. Could it be big? Well, the, the answer, uh, surprisingly, comes from the people in this figure here. These are some trapeze artists on the left. They know the answer to this question because it's a very basic mechanical question. So how do you get a trapeze moving most efficiently? And the answer is you don't kick once per swing, which is what we all did, I think, when we were learning how to swing. You kick two times. When you kick two times per oscillation, you hit what is called the primary parametric resonance, which they never taught you about, even if you took <laughs> physics 101. It's a very unusual type of resonance, which converts, which allows energy to be transferred between forces at right angles to, to one another. Okay, and that's what we're talking about with light. When we consider the E and the B factors, the electric and the magnetic fields of the light are at 90 degrees. So the fact they could co cooperate on any kind of motion is um, a little unusual. But the trapeze artists know that this works. If you've ever seen a video of a, a guy just jumping up onto a trapeze and starting to swing, within about four swings you can get full amplitude. How is that possible? Because you have, it's a very difficult problem, you start to think about it. How do you get lateral motion by kicking your legs. Doesn't make any sense on the face of it, but they know it works. Okay? So we're going to watch that same cartoon with the benefit of trapeze hindsight. And I, I've actually added a blue dot here to keep track of how many kicks there are in the direction of travel of the light, which was to the left, right? Left, right? <laughs> so the, the red charge is going to follow the motion that you saw. The blue one will keep track of how many kicks there are per swing. So I'll just let, let this run. So each time, let's, let's follow on the next oscillation here, we'll follow the red curve and count the number of blues. So one, two, and the red comes back to where it started. One, two, and the red is back to where it started. So it exactly hits this parametric resonance called a primary resonance every time, and it's for free. So this is how the magnetic field, a very small magnetic field, which is like your, your uh, pathetic kicking on the trapeze, can actually cause very large motion in a few cycles that transfers all the energy of that motion into a new motion. So this is actually what's behind the equations and things that we've done in the lab. I'll just show you a few pictures. Um, uh, like everyone else, we were schooled in the fact that this could never happen. So uh, we, uh, when we first tried some experiments, we were happy to find that it didn't happen at 
uh, low intensities, but made the mistake of turning our laser power up, whereupon we saw some very new things. Uh, here I've got a, a picture, just a schematic of a laser source in the upper left that sends uh, uh, pulses into a sample down in the lower right, and we simply look at the scattered light at 90 degrees with respect to that and try to map out the, the pattern of the radiation that comes out. And at 90 degrees like this, it's possible uh, if, if you, you look at the light this way, in a sense, if the electric field's oriented this way and you look at it this way, you see Rayleigh scattering, which is what accounts for the blue color of the sky. It's a very common phenomenon. But if you turn 90 degrees to that, that other orientation uh, allows the magnetic scattering to be seen. So the result of experiments at higher power, just uh, shown here, I'll try to show you the patterns. Uh, these open circles in this funny looking uh, polar plot uh, show you, you do have a vertical dipole, which is the usual Rayleigh scattering. But then uh, when we make a second measurement, you get the black um, dipole at 90 degrees to that, uh, you see something that's uh, not supposed to be there at all, let alone uh, as large as one quarter of the, the other pattern. So uh, this is forbidden in classical electromagnetic theory by a factor of about 10 to the fifth. The black dot simply should not be there whatsoever. There's no doubt that it's a dipole because the magnified picture shows you that and, and so on. So this is one of the effects that the cartoon was trying to show us ought to take place if there's a strong EB type of nonlinearity in the system. Uh, the one we're more interested in, though, which comes part and parcel of this sort of response, is charge separation. And we uh, haven't seen that in the lab yet, but we're looking, and that's the reason I'm giving the talk today, to give you a, a feel for what the possibilities really are. So we said before, uh, charge separation should occur along the direction of travel of the light. Anytime you have charge separation, it's like you've, you've uh, created a battery. So the light somehow has stored energy in, in the medium. Uh, can we store useful amounts of it? That's, that's the question. Be, and recognize uh, immediately that the light actually hasn't been absorbed. It's just applying a force on the medium. So it hasn't done any work that would generate heat. So this might be interesting. So here's a little schematic. Now the, the light in this case is going to the right um, just to confuse you and the electric field is still vertical. The charge separation we're talking about is along the axis, or direction of travel. And there it is for one intensity. If I double the intensity, it gets bigger and, and so on. So that's in space, in the, it, what you would see if you measured things spatially. If I plot that versus time, I see that th this complicated motion, which is sort of a looping motion, um, it starts at zero. As time progresses in this second plot, uh, I very quickly establish some kind of vertical displacement of the charge. That's what we're interested in. There's a faster oscillation, which we're not interested in. It's really the average position we've induced, uh, which uh, might be useful to us. That represents the degree of charge separation. And again, if I use one intensity and then double it, you see uh, this curve is uh, shown to, uh, to move up. Now the big surprise here is that normally in research level optics, nonlinear optics in particular, uh, effects involving more than one field have to be uh, what's called coherent. The, the fields have to have the same sort of sinusoidal uh, development in time that we write down mathematically as a sine or a cosine wave. Um, so we expect that this sort of thing could, could happen with coherent light if E and B are working together as long as they're working as a team. The surprise is that if you break up the light and neither the electric field nor the magnetic component are really oscillating in a very predictable way over, uh, over time, but they're all broken up in terms of the phase and the amplitude and the polarization, as they would be in sunlight on a very short time scale, uh, you get the same average level. And this is very surprising, but it's because the B field is involved in this uh, interaction. The B field has an arrow of time associated with it that uh, the 
electric field does not. So for the first time we have a uh, prediction of a nonlinear effect here which could respond to sunlight in the same way that it responds to a laser beam. That's pretty unusual. Uh, it's very good for a potential application, right? It means it could indeed work for uh, sunlight. So now again in the interest of going back to discovery level here, uh, what we're talking about in charge separation is something like a capacitor. Uh, those of you who are old enough to have been hunting around in old barns and things for uh, electrical artifacts will recognize what's on this slide. These are Leyden jars, which are some of the earliest capacitors. And if you charge these up electrically, uh, they're not batteries because there's no chemistry going on here, but they can certainly hold a very powerful punch. In fact, they're fatal uh, if you touch them, but they can effectively run the lights in a, a hotel for one evening and then would need to be charged up again. Uh, we're talking uh, about the possibility here of uh, using this new effect to charge a capacitor and have uh, something you might call an optical capacitor. So how would this work? Uh, the idea of our research is to investigate whether we get a, a voltage end-to-end -end due to light passing through a completely transparent piece of material. So we don't, we're not imagining semiconductor material at all here. The dynamics I've shown you occur atom by atom in material that could be completely transparent, like window glass. Okay, not semiconductor at all, so cheap, simple to make, large areas. And if you're not actually extracting power, you start thinking about it, the light just goes through the medium and you could grow crops right under these generators. And you turn them on and they begin to take energy out of the light and it, and it dims, but it's it's not absorbed, interestingly enough. So uh, how could we make use of something like this? Uh, the idea is that um, this optical capacitor, it's just the converter, so we'll, we'll use one of those on the left. And the rest of the circuit, as it turns out, that we would need to store energy in something like a lithium ion battery has been worked out uh, for many years now. And is very efficient technology. It's like 95% efficient. Um, so it all depends on whether this interaction at the left is feasible, uh, would be nice, uh, for a reason I'm going to uh, re-emphasize in, in a minute here. Uh, but by this time you're thinking, boy, this is complicated. Why, why, do we, why do these guys go to such trouble to do this at all? We already have solar cells, and that's true, right? But I'll remind you, they generate all that heat. If you scale them up, you try to solve your energy problems, at the megawatt level, you're generating megawatts of heat needlessly. So this is a serious issue. With an optical capacitor, if you're not actually using it and pulling energy off the, the light wave, the light just goes right through the material. So you're not making the surface of the earth opaque. <laughs> we don't generate any heat because it turns out that this is a question of getting a response in it's called the ground state of the, the atoms in quantum mechanics. Uh, we don't need optical absorption to get things started. Uh, it's actually a two-field process, which kind of takes you quickly up and back where you started, and you're getting just this charge separation that you want without having had the energy absorbed and, and only partly used. It, this can work at all wavelengths. That's important if it could ever be uh, used for sunlight power generation. Amazingly, it responds, as I said, to both coherent and incoherent light. Um, and uh, we published a paper trying to investigate how high the efficiency uh, could be. And uh, if you imagine causing this charging effect many, many times per second with a pulsed laser or some other means, if you get up to about 10 to the 8th pulses per second, the efficiency rises to things that are pretty interesting, tens of percent. So that means there, there are possibilities with this to transmit power without transmission lines, as I mentioned here. Um, think of that as maybe a new capability of energizing a disabled mission. Could be a mission on Mars that you power back up from uh, a uh, circulating spacecraft and that uh, fires a beam down. It would be a relatively compact structure as long as you, you hit it as depicted in the cartoon here. Um, 
Yeah, these are uh, capabilities that just don't exist at the present time. And in the, the cold vacuum of space, uh, maybe you could get away from the problems that the space engineers talk about all the time, these thermal uh, uh, disruptions that occur in uh, any system, actually, that's uh, built in space, and they have radiation problems associated with them. So uh, I've talked mostly about the possibility of efficient uh, solar energy conversion here. Uh, that's a pretty interesting one in comparison with the large-scale arrays that I showed you, if we could avoid heat. And so um, yeah, all of this is uh, prefaced in the fact that we're following some new science here, looking at its possibilities. So it's uh, certainly the case that new science is uh, relevant to sustainable power generation. There are power, uh, power problems that need to be solved. And the, one of the conclusions should be that we need more good ideas and, and even educational tools. So I'm going to leave you with one uh, final thought here or a, a link that you might be interested in because we have uh, lots of creative young people, of course. And uh, they are thinking along these lines. It's important to get people thinking about the issues of sustainability and one of the ways to do that is to start young with educational kits. Uh, here's an example of one that came to my attention. The uh, website is mudwatt.com uh, where uh, you can buy a kit that uh, uses mud. The, the electrifying microbes in the mud actually generate enough uh, uh, with encouragement and instructions in the kit, generate power enough to uh, power up a light and a clock and there's even an app, I understand, to, uh, that you can download to measure the performance and, and go to the next level, literally. So I actually have one of those if you want to take a look at it afterward. Uh, the the MudWatt seems to be a good educational tool to uh, get people thinking along important lines about what sustainable energy really, really means when we try to solve the whole problem instead of just half the problem with that. I'll, I'll quit and I thank you for your attention. This is a, it's actually pretty, pretty nice, but it would be much nicer if we can actually make these sunflower blades just look like sunflower in color, right? So 